there are other other algorithms for public key cryptography. We will, in this course, look at RSA. We'll look at one other a little bit later, next year. And I'm going to skip over a few slides here about the general requirements for public key cryptography. We'll use RSA as an example, then come back to them at a later date and, and return to those concepts. Developed by Ravesh, Shamir and Edelman in 1978 and they set up, or there, there's a company now, RSA Security, quite large in terms of cryptography and they sell products eventually uh, using RSA and other algorithms. So it's the most widely used public key algorithm. It's a block cipher, it operates on a blocks, on a block of data where the plain text must be represented as an integer. So if you have a, have a JPEG that you want to encrypt with RSA, then you take a block of bits from that image, okay, you take some bits, and that's an integer. Those, say you take a thousand bits and you get a 1000 bit integer number, and that's used in the RSA algorithm that we just saw. Plain text raised to the power of E mod N, and you get your ciphertext. And that's the, the block of ciphertext. A bit more, a few more details about the algorithm. So we encrypt in blocks. Same in a, any block cipher. If we have a large piece of plain text, then we divide it into blocks and encrypt one block at a time. And there are ways to combine those blocks together, similar to the modes of operation for the symmetric ciphers. The block must be, the value must be less than n. Okay, n is our modulus and will be chosen, so the block must be less. So in practice, what you do is, let's say n is a 1024-bit number. Okay, if n is a 1024-bit number, then the block is a size of i bits, where i is chosen such that it, 2 to the power of i is less than n. Uh, a simpler example, if, if n is 100, not 100 bits, but the, the decimal value of 100, how big is the block? How big should the block be? If, if n is the decimal value of 100, then we'd set the block to be how many bits? I bits. How many? Six. Two to the power of six is sixty-four. No, two to the power of seven is one hundred and twenty-eight. That is, if n is one hundred in decimal, then we'd take a normally six bits of plain text as a block, because with six bits we'll always get a number less than 100. In fact, 60, 60, less than 64. If we had 7 bits, we may get some numbers greater than 100, and our plain text must be less than n. So that's, if we have n is a 1,024-bit number, then we can choose the block size. And to encrypt, we've seen m to the power of e mod n. Decrypt, same algorithm in fact, just change the values of the input. C to the power of D mod N, so the same steps. It's just here we use a different value uh, than for the exponent. Same N. We'll come to this part in a moment. And each user has a public and private key. And we normally denote the public key as the two values E and N, the pair of values, and the private key the two values D and N. But note, N is not private. Okay? It, because it's the same N, if I choose my values of E, what did I choose? E equal to 4, D equal to 2, N equals to 20. If I choose those values, they're bad values, but if I did, then I would tell you my value of E equals 4. I would tell you my value of N equals 20 because they are public. 
so I can tell you my public key. I would not tell you my value of D. I must keep that private. Okay? So even though we write N as part of the private key, N is known to other users because it's in the public key as well. So the secret value is D. And we must keep D secret, otherwise it, it no longer is secure. So we need to look at why does it, well, under what conditions does RSA work? We saw a case where it didn't work, where we decrypted and we got the wrong plain text. Of course we cannot allow that. So under what conditions, what values of E, N and D does it work? And then we'll, that will determine how to choose E, D and N. Note, if we substitute this equation for C into the decryption equation, so we have two equations here, C equals M to the E mod N, and M equals C to the D mod N. Encrypt, decrypt. Now, replace this C with the first equation. And that's what we get on this second line here. We get, and we'll write it on the board, If we take the decryption equation and replace C with M to the power of E mod N, that was the value of C, all raised to the power of D, that's a D, mod N. That's this equation, or here. And the properties of mod is that we can take it out of the brackets here. And they it becomes m to the power of e to the power all to the power of d mod n mod n. When we do multiple mods by the same modulus, it's just the same as doing one mod. So simply mod n. And again a simple property of our exponential, that equals m to the power of e multiplied by d mod n. So what that says is that if I encrypt using this equation and then decrypt using m equals c to the power of d mod n, then it means that m equals the same value m to the power of ed mod n. Under what conditions is this true? That's what we want to find out. We saw a case where it's not true. Because what we did is that we had our original m, let's say m1 here, we encrypted using our equation, and then we decrypted and we got this other M2, 5, we get a different M. And that was unsuccessful, of course. That's because the values of E, D, and N were inappropriate. So we want to find values of E, D, and N such that when you take a number and you raise it to E multiplied by D and mod by N, you get that same number back. Anyone know when that is true? Look at this equation. Does it look familiar to you? One of the theorems. Okay, if you go back to the theorems. We had Fermat's theorem and Euler's theorem, and in fact they're similar. Here, something e is equivalent to su the same number raised to the power of E multiplied by D in mod N. This was from earlier today. We say when we mod N, then A is equivalent to age raised to the power of the totient of N plus 1. That was Euler's theorem. 
similar structure. Replace A with M. And let's see what the requirements are for that to work. I'm going to go through an example. I'll do it on the board, I think. You have it printed, hopefully, at the end of your this topic in your handouts. Let's check. So at the end of this topic you have some notes on number theory, just to remind you, and then a, a handout on public key cryptography. And I'm going to go through that on the board, so you don't have to copy it all, you can make notes as you go. And we'll turn this off. So the, the question is, when does RSA work? And given the encryption and decryption equations, it should work if this is true. If m equals m to the power of ed mod n. Well, under what conditions is that true? That's what we want to find out. And we note that there's some similarity between our equation m equals m to the power of ed mod n and Euler's equation here. a equals a, or is equivalent to a to the power of the totient of n plus 1 in mod n. So let's try and take advantage of that and write our equation uh, in a similar form. That is, when does this equation or statement match this one? Under what conditions? I'll write them both. Well, we've got the first one. This is Euler's equation. I've just replaced A with M. We know this is true. Okay. So under what conditions is this equation true? When does m equal m to the power of ed? Compare the two equations, Euler's equation and our one for RSA. Well, Maybe easier. What's different between this and this? Ed, this this exponent here, and the totient of n plus one. Okay, for them to be the same. So for this one to have the form of Euler's equation, we would need what? We need Ed to be equal to the totient of n plus one. Okay. If it was, that would be the same. Because if ED equals the totient of n plus 1, then this becomes m equals m to the totient of n plus 1 mod n. And we know that's true. So this will be true if ED equals the totient of n plus 1. Is that step clear? We want to derive and find out un what values of E, D and N to choose. So we'll go through these steps to do so. And again, this is in your handouts written up a bit more detailed. At the end of the, the slides, there's a handout on public key cryptography, some examples. Okay, So you have it there. So we're at the state that 
we need this to be true. When you take uh, what's eight plus one mod eight? What is nine plus one mod eight? A uh, mod nine. Okay. What is x plus 1 mod x? 1. What is the totient of n plus 1 mod the totient of n? 1. OK, now let's use that. And here, let's mod both sides by the totient of n. We can do that. We have this. Uh, statement here. Apply the same operation on both sides. So if this is true, let's mod both sides by E times D mod the totient of N. So if E times D equals the totient of N plus 1, then it's also true that E times D mod the totient of N, I'll put it in brackets, equals the totient of N plus 1 mod the totient of n. So all I did took this statement and took the mod of both sides. What is the right hand side? From here it's 1. The totient of n plus 1 mod the totient of n is 1. So now we have the case that our original equation will be true if E times D mod the totient of N equals 1. What, what does this resemble? E times D mod the totient of N equals 1. The multiplicative inverse. E times D equals 1 in the mod of the totient of N. Let's make sure everyone can see this. So our conditions are now, so again, repeat. We have this equation. We need this to be true for RSA to work. Under what conditions, conditions is this true? Well, let's equate it to Euler's theorem. And we know Euler's theorem is true. So long as the exponent here is the totient of n plus 1. Here we have e times d. So if we set E times D to be the totient of N plus 1, this will be true. So let's do that. E times D equals the totient of N plus 1. In that case, RSA will work. All I've done now is taken the mod in totient of N of both sides. Okay. And so ED mod the totient of N and the right-hand side mod the totient of N. And we know that the right-hand side can be simplified to just 1. Totient of n plus 1, all mod totient of n is just 1. So now, our condition is, and we can write this differently, E times D is equivalent to 1. When we use mod the totient of n. That's just a different way that we write the mod. We can write it in two ways. Don't write this one down. We can write A mod B equals C, or A is equivalent to C in mod B. Okay. 
here, just different, no, different ways to write a modulus. Here we say A mod B equals C, or we can say A is equivalent to C when we mod both by B. Okay. That's all I've done here. E, e times D mod the totient of N equals 1, or E times D is equivalent to 1 when we mod both sides by the totient of N. What is this? And you said it before. That's our definition of, I don't know, multiplicative inverse. If D is the multiplicative inverse of E, then this is true. Multiply two numbers and get one as the answer, then they are multiplicative inverses of each other. Able to find a good pen. What's when does E have a multiplicative inverse? When is this true? The multiplicative inverse exists when E and the totient of n are relatively prime. Okay? Because remember back to our original definition, some number has a multiplicative inverse if that number is relatively prime with the modulus. So, because not all numbers have a multiplicative inverse. So, now we say for RSA to work, our condition is that E is relatively prime with a totient of n. That is the, the greatest common divisor of E and the totient of n equals 1. So that's one of our conditions for RSA to work. Choose a value of n and e such that e is relatively pr prime with the totient of n. Note this is not n, this is the totient of n. Because if this is true, then we know that we can find some multiplicative inverse. We can find d. If it's not true, then we may not be able to find d. Okay, so we need e to be relatively prime with the totient of n. If that's true, there is a multiplicative inverse, there is a D that exists, and we can find D, there are algorithms to find D, and we haven't covered it, but Euclid's algorithm can be used to find D. That is, if you know the totient of N, and if you choose some E, which is relatively prime with it, there's algorithms to, to reasonably quickly find the multiplicative inverse. Okay? D is the inverse of E. That is, multiply them together and you get 1. So we've reached one of our conditions for how RSA will work. For this to be true, choose E relatively prime with the totient of N. And then once you've got that E, calculate D such that E times D equals 1. And then this equation is equivalent or is in the form of Euler's equation and it will always be true. So what we're going to arrive at is the steps that the user must use to, f to choose E, D and N. Okay? If you remember back to the example I had before, I had an E of 4, a D of 2 and an N of 20. I chose them I, effectively randomly. They didn't work. So in fact we need an algorithm for choosing E, D and N. Well what are the conditions of that algorithm? Here's one of them. So that when you generate your keys you use this condition. Let's stop that part there. There's some conditions. Come back to the totient of N. is how do we calculate the totient of n? The totient of some number. 
going to the end of our number theory slides, we mentioned today, calculating the totient of a large number is hard. If n is a very large number, then finding its totient is practically impossible. Unless we have some uh, specific value of n. Okay? Let's say we choose a large n, a random number, and it's a thousand bits long, then there are no known ways to calculate the totient of it in a reason, reasonable amount of time. But we need the totient of n because we need to find e which is relatively prime with it. So now the question is, for RSA we need to choose a value of n. And we need to choose a value such that it will be easy to calculate the totient of n. So what should we choose? How should we choose n? Normally calculating the totient of n is hard, except in some cases. When is it easy? I didn't write it up there, but we saw it recently. When is it easy to calculate the totient of n? When it's the multiplication of two prime numbers. If n equals p times q, where p and q are prime numbers, then we know that the totient of n equals p minus 1 times q minus 1. So if I choose two prime numbers, p and q, multiply them together, I get n. Then I can quickly calculate the totient of n. It's a simple calculation. p minus 1 minus, multiplied by q minus 1. So what we need for RSA, there are other ways to choose n. We do this, or we set this requirement so that it's practically uh, easy to generate the keys. Okay. The user that creates their keys must choose values of n, e, and d. We have a requirement on e. We set a requirement on how they should choose n so that it's easy to calculate the totient of, of n because we need that here. So we require the user to choose two prime numbers, p and q, multiply them together, and then you get n. You can easily determine the totient of n. And then from that you can just choose a value e which is relatively prime with the totient of n. And then there's algorithms to calculate d, the multiplicative inverse of e. And we know that there will be an inverse of e because it is relatively prime with the totient of n. This condition. So that's how you choose e, d and n to work in RSA. You choose two prime numbers, calculate n, calculate the totient of n, choose e which is relatively prime with that, and then calculate d. And you have e, e d and n, and because we've followed through these steps, our encryption and decryption will always work because we're relying on this form of Euler's equation. That is, these are equivalent. So let's, let's try it with another example and, and see how to generate those keys. So this is really the key generation steps. How does a user create their public and private key? We have an example on the handout. Okay, we have an example that I'll go through again on the board. It's in the handout, so you have it in front of you. So instead of choosing any value for E, D, and N, we need to generate values. So what we do is we choose P and Q which it must be prime numbers. Okay? So in this example I'm going to choose p equal to 17 
and Q equal to 11. We'll, we'll return later to the security of RSA and they should be large prime numbers. But of course in this example I'm using small ones so we can calculate on the board. But choose two prime numbers. Calculate N. What's N? Well, 17 times 11, 187. So now we have our value for N. Here, N equals P times Q. Next, calculate the totient of N. The totient of 187, if I give you that in the exam, if you try and manually calculate, you'll take forever. Well, not forever, but you'll take a long time. But if you recognise, like you... Uh, no, there wasn't a question in the exam this semester yet. If you recognise that 187 is in fact P times Q, two prime numbers, then we know immediately that the totient of 187 is 16 times 10. 17 minus 1 times 11 minus 1. One hundred and sixty. So this is the steps that you take when you create your own keys. Choose the two primes, calculate n, calculate the totient of n. What do you do next? We have n, we have the totient of n, now choose an e which is relatively prime. In this, there are multiple values, that, so there are multiple E's that you can choose here. In this case, I'm going to choose 7. A small value, we can calculate the answer. Is it relatively prime with 160? It's a prime number. So the factors of 7 are 1 and 7. So is 160 divisible by 7? No. Therefore, they are relatively prime. Okay. Because, remember, relatively prime, the greatest common divisor is 1. The divisors of E are 1 and 7. There are many divisors of 160. Are any of them 7? No. Therefore, the greatest common divisor between these two is 1. They're relatively prime. Now you calculate D. And running out of space. 7 times something equals 1 in mod 160. We can get rid of this. And, all right, you can trial, try different numbers. So 7 times something equals, 100 and, equals 1. 7 times some number, mod 160 equals 1. That's what you're trying to solve. Find that number. Or the other words... Seven times some number either equals 161. Is there such a number? That is 161 divided by 7. Do we get an integer? Will you use your calculator? No, I don't think so. Actually, maybe you do. No. You do. 23. 7 times 23, 140, 161. Easy one in this case. 7 times 23 is 161. 161 mod 160 is 1. Okay. That's why I had 161 here, because when we mod by 160, we want the answer to be 1. 
Easy. D was 23. And now we have our keys. E is 7, N is 187. That's the public key, E and N. Private key, D is 23, N is 187. So the generation of the keys, and they're the keys in fact used in the example on the, in the lecture notes. And you can check. You can check when you choose any value of M that's less than N, you encrypt and decrypt, you always get the plain text back. Any questions on how to generate keys? So we've gone through two things. Why or a derivation of the rules for generating the keys. And then we gave an example of how to apply those rules to generate keys. You should understand both, I think. The derivation and the, the example, the, the applying the steps. And you'll see past exam questions or even quiz questions generate the keys for RSA. But for small values like this, this is not so hard. With larger values, of course, it's much harder. We need uh, computer support. So in RSA, I think every user generates their key pair. So what each of you does is follows these steps, generates your key of public private key, and then you can advertise your public key to everyone else. You keep your value of D private. So you can tell everyone PU is 7187, but of course you don't tell anyone that D is 23. And then you encrypt or if someone wants to send to you, they encrypt with your public key and you decrypt with your private key. Any questions before we look at the harder part? Yep. You would follow those steps. So the steps for key generation are these. A very large one, you'd have some software that would do it for you. Okay? But exactly those steps. For, a very, for real keys, we need to use larger values. We'll see why later. But that is, you choose two large prime numbers, P and Q. So your software chooses two large prime numbers, multiplies them together, gets N, calculates the totion of N, which is very easy. It's just multiply two numbers. And then there are algorithms for finding a number relatively prime, so testing if a number is relatively prime with the totion of n. So choose an e. And in fact, in practice, you can use the same e as other people. So one common value of e is 3. Okay? Even if you have very large values of the prime numbers and n, you can choose e, equal to, be, e to be 3. And someone else can also have the same value of E. So long as the values of N are different, it's still reasonably secure, or secure un except in very special cases. So you can choose your own value of E, but there are also some recommended values because they're better for, for implementation. And there are algorithms for given E, find D. Okay? And they're reasonably fast. You can write software quite easily to do this. It's just that as the numbers get bigger and bigger, it gets slower and slower. Okay. There are some difficulties in there. 
Choose two large prime numbers is the problem. Choosing prime numbers is not easy. Large prime numbers. Okay. Tell me a prime number which is 500 bits in length then it's not easy to determine uh, whether a number is prime or not. But it turns out that the, in most cases there are ways to test with reasonable confidence that a number is prime. So you randomly choose a number, test if it's prime, if it, and it gives you enough confidence that it's prime, then use that and then just choose another one. Multiply them together. Any other questions before we remove some of this. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, the question or the comment is if we calculated D in generating my key, and in particular my secret value d, I calculated it from e. Okay? In this case I knew e was 7 and I calculated d was 23. So if I can do that, then why can't a malicious user, an attacker, also do that? Because remember, a malicious user knows my public values. They know e and n. And they want to find d. So let's look at how or what the malicious user needs to do to break this. By break it, I mean, for example, find D, because that should be secret, or later we'll see to um, find the plain text given ciphertext. Let's remove this. Before we go through that, let's make a, another point. What should be secret? D, of course, should be secret. When you generate keys, you also choose prime numbers P and Q. They should be secret as well. That's a, an important point. P and Q, the values you chose, you should not tell anyone. N you can, but P and Q you cannot. Now the question is, if the attacker knows Let's say the attacker, what information do they know? Well, what's public? They know E equals 7. They know N equals 187. Anything else they know at the start? They know the algorithm, so they know uh, the steps that were applied to generate the key. They don't know D. If they find D, then this is insecure. So how do they find D? What's some steps? What, okay, f why find P and Q? <coughs> uh, so we can find the totion, phi over N. Okay? So, Let's go backwards in our steps. What do we do? To find D, to generate D, we had E and we had the totion of N. And given those, we said that if we have E and the totion of N, then it's relatively easy to find D. Okay? So if the attacker, they know E, to find D, then they must find the totion of N. Because if they can find the totion of N, then given E, they can find D. Okay. How do they find the totion of N? Find P and Q. Okay. Or two ways. So we know N equals 187. The question is now, what is the totion of 187? From the attacker's perspective. And two ways to find that. What we say, the manual approach. Let's look at all the numbers from 1 up to 186 and compare if they're relatively prime with 187. Because by definition, we just count those numbers and that gives us the totion of n. 
So we can manually, let's, uh, let's say we manually calculate. With 187, it's easy in fact. It wouldn't take long for a piece of software or even you could do it in an exam. Just list the numbers from 1 up to 186 and determine which ones are relatively prime with 187. But if this was a large number, then, and we said at the end of the number theory slides today that determining the totient manually of a large number is practically impossible. So if n is very large, 187 is not large, but n is say 1000 bits long, then manually finding the totient of n is considered impossible. Okay. So if we cannot do that, what else can the attacker do? I think you said it before. Well, instead of manually determining the totient of n, find p and q. Okay? Because once we know p and q, it's easy to calculate. So to find d, there are two approaches. One, manually determine totient of n. Two, find p and q. How do we find P and Q? We've got N, how do we find P and Q? What's the, the process called? And if I don't have the size, uh, integer factorization is the name. Uh, let's show. the last slide of our number theory said that there are certain problems in number theory which are practically impossible to solve if the numbers are large enough. And we cannot see it yet. Here we go. The first one, integer factorization. We said that if we have two unknown primes, P and Q, which are multiplied together, then given n, it's practically impossible to find p and q, which is the challenge for the attacker here. They know n, they need to find p and q. When n is 187, it's easy. Okay? You can try different numbers. And I think some of you did that in the uh, midterm exam. But when n is a 1,000-bit number, it will take too long to find p and q. Okay? There are no way no known ways to do that in reasonable time. So integer, integer factorization, factoring a, a large number into its primes is considered impossible if the number is large enough. If we could do that, then we could easily break RSA. Because we'd find P and Q, we'd find the totient of N, then we'd find D, okay, it's no longer secure. But we cannot do that if it's large enough. Similar, manually determining the totient of n, calculating Euler's totient. With large enough n, manually calculating it is considered impossible. Okay, so there are no known algorithms that would do it in reasonable time. So the attacker's task of solving these two problems becomes very hard if we increase the, the size of those numbers. Okay. In this simple example, you could solve it but with large numbers you would not be able to. And that's where the strength of RSA comes in. That we can generate the keys, but without knowledge of PQ, the two primes, it's practically impossible to find out what the secret value D is. So the user knows D and the attacker cannot find D. Can the attacker do anything else? What else can they try? So here we tried to find D. Two ways we, we see. If the numbers are large enough, they won't work. Anything else? Let's 
show what we've done. Remember how we generated the keys. Okay. P times Q, totient, relatively prime. Well, that didn't work for the attacker because we couldn't find the totient of N. And if we can't find the totient of N, then we can't find D. Okay. So that approach doesn't work if our numbers are large enough. Yep. Will there always be a P and Q? You choose P and Q, so yes. Your first step here, key generation, your first step when you generate your own keys, choose two, two large prime numbers. So yes, that's what you start with. Then you calculate N. So you know P and Q as the attacker doesn't know it. Anything else that we can do? log n what about from the encryption equations Again. <coughs> Let's write down our, our known algorithms for encryption and decryption and see if the attacker can take advantage of that. C equals M to the E mod N and similar M equals C to the D mod N. What can we do? Let's say we have, in the past, we've obtained a ciphertext value and the corresponding plaintext. We don't know the key, but we've been lucky enough that we've intercepted some ciphertext and we've somehow found out the, the plaintext. Okay? It's an old message, it doesn't give us any value, but what if we know M and C? as the attacker. What if they know M, so C, and of course they still know E and N. They want to find D. Well, look at this equation. Here's an equation with four variables. M equals C to the D mod N. Three of them are known. One is unknown. Easy. What is it? D equals the discrete log in base C of M. Mod N. Here we have an ex exponential. C to the power of D mod N equals M the inverse operation, that is find the exponent, find D given M, C and N, which is a discrete logarithm. The discrete log base C mod N of M equals D. So you just need to solve the discrete logarithm. How do they know M? Well maybe they've determined, a, they found a plain text uh, from an old message, it's no longer relevant, but they found the uh, plaintext ciphertext pair. So that's possible in some cases. So if they find M, C, and E, and N, solve a discrete logarithm. And we said that's impossible. Another challenge in number theory is, I'll show you the, on the board in a moment, a third challenge in number theory is to solving discrete logarithms. It's practically impossible to factor a number into its primes. It's practically impossible to manually determine Euler's totient. And it's practically impossible to solve discrete logarithms. 
practically impossible when the numbers are large enough. Okay? So, the challenge solve a discrete logarithm. But we understand that if the numbers are large enough, we cannot solve that. Okay? So we see that these, these difficult problems in number theory are what make RSA strong. In theory, there's a solution. In practice, it takes too long to find that solution. Anyone else want to break RSA? Any other approaches? Brute force. What does brute force involve with RSA? How would you brute force? Different approaches. All right, one approach, we're trying to find D. Or we want, want to decrypt some information, for example. So we have, uh, what do we have? We have this equation. We, we know a ciphertext. We know an, the N. If we don't know the plain text, a brute force would be try all possible values of D. Okay? Because, and the same with the brute force in any cipher. If we just try the different values, eventually we'll get a value of the plain text that makes sense. So we take our cipher text, raise it to the power of D, mod by N, where we just choose a random value of D. We get some plain text M. If it makes sense, success. If it doesn't make sense, try a different value of D and keep trying. So there's one brute force attack. Try different values of D. How do we prevent that? Make sure D is large enough. Okay. Make sure D is large enough such that we must make many attempts and it takes too long to try them all to find the plain text. So the size of D is important in this case. Anything else that we can try? Similar here. We've got the inverse operation. We know C, we know E, we know N, find M which is a discrete logarithm except it's slightly different. We're trying to find the base when we know the index. Same difficulty as, a dis as the finding D. So this equation we can write, or we have a challenge, find M given the ciphertext E and N. And again it comes down to solving a discrete logarithm, which is too hard if the numbers are large enough. There may be a few others that we've, we haven't covered. The idea is to look at what the attacker knows. They know the algorithm, they know the public information, and then what steps do they have to take to try and find the secret information, the plain text or the key, or the private key, in particular D. And it turns out in all cases, so long as we have numbers large enough, there are no known techniques which, which will do it in reasonable time. And RSA today is considered secure with large enough numbers. Any questions on those things we've gone through for RSA today? What you should take from this today, okay, understand the basic equation, understand how to generate keys, the steps, the lecture notes Describe those steps in more detail. Okay, you have them in the slides. Be able to generate the keys. I'll give you some quiz examples of generating keys, simple ones. Understand, although it's removed, how, why we need those steps to generate keys. Why is it that we need to choose E relatively prime with a totient of n? 
So there's steps that we derive there. And then eventually, maybe we'll return next, in two, yeah, next week, what can the attacker do to try and break it? So what opportunities does the attacker have to try and break RSA? And eventually, in all cases you lead to, you'll find problems which are too hard so long as the numbers are large enough. And that is enough for today on RSA. Let's stop there. I hope what you see, so the last thing I hope what you see is the, the, the beauty in RSA in that here's the encryption algorithm. The most simplest equation you can see in any cipher, almost simpler than Caesar cipher in writing it down, and yet secure. Let's stop. Well, I'll give you some examples next week, but how long will an attacker take? If the numbers are large enough, it will take you forever. Hundreds of years, thousands of years. Okay. So, simple method, than on the simpler method, you'll do that in an exam. Okay. <laughs> on, on the simple numbers. Like simple method, but takes yes. as long as triple Yes, yes. Sim simple, simple algorithm, but it's as secure as the other algorithms. Okay. Correct.